use of generative AI in health. It's an area that you've given a huge amount of thought to, uh, and I think uh, you're excited about. Can you share what your vision is there? I got into AI 13 years ago, gosh. I was a programmer before for 23 years, building large-scale systems as a hedge fund manager and other things. When my son was diagnosed with autism, and then I built an NLP team to analyze all the clinical literature, and then looked at biomolecular pathway analysis of neurotransmitters, GABA and glutamate in the brain to repurpose drugs for him, and he went to major school, which was great, N equals one. And then I was one of I was lead architect on the uh, one of the COVID AI projects with the United Nations, launched at Stanford and others. And then because I didn't get the technology, I was like, oh, we've got to build it ourselves. But what is health? You know, again, I think we have this discussion a lot. Healthcare is sick care. We don't have all the information that we should have at our fingertips. Health assumes ergodicity. A thousand tosses of the coin is the same as a, as a coin tossed a thousand times, but we are all individual. And across the world, there are amazing data sets that could be better because when you write down a clinical trial or your own kind of experiences, you lose so much information. At the same time, you don't have all the information on cancer, or autism, multiple sclerosis at your fingertips in a comprehensive, authoritative, and up-to-date way. So when I look at the health operating system, we're going to build a GPT-4 open for cancer. And it's going to mean that nobody is alone again on that journey and loses that agency because they know comprehensive authority of state all their knowledge. But AI models today already outperform human doctors on empathy. So they're not going to be alone on that anymore. Yeah, Can I just double click on what you just said? Because it's really important. I have so many people because of my role as chairman of Fountain Life who reach out and say, I just got diagnosed with this cancer or my brother or my sister or my wife. And and there is, they're left with this decimating news and they're left Googling. Um, but a model that's able to have the most cutting edge information and then incorporate all their medical data and give them advice in empathic fashion how far is that? See, a couple of years if we focus, maybe even like next year. And that's yeah. amazing. Because yeah, for is. all of these topics that, again, we will have diagnosis that is superior. We will have research augmentation. Because again, even researchers don't have all that knowledge at their fingertips. And again, this is public infrastructure and a public good. You know, from primary care all the way through to that. What is the open infrastructure of the future where this technology can come again to your own data as well? You have uh, things like Melody and other things around homomorphic encryption, federated learning, that they were trying to figure out how to preserve privacy. We can run a language model on a smartphone right now <laughs> that can analyze all your data and then just feed back stuff to a global collective. But people are people. So when I look at healthcare, I see amazing data sets that we can activate by taking the models to the data. An infrastructure that we can build, like we had Checks Agent with Stanford, the top X-ray radio radiology model to build good standard things across the entire gamut of healthcare. So we can actually get to healthcare versus sick care. So we can make it so that everyone is empowered to make the best decisions, either as experts or individuals, and make it so nobody is alone again, as well as increasing the data quality that will then feed better models that will then save lives, save suffering, and again, increase our potential. Like you've got a longevity book behind you, right? Why don't you have all the latest knowledge of longevity at your fingertips at a GPT-4 level right now? That will happen over the next year. We will launch Stable Health or whatever you decide to call it, and there will be the smartest people in each of these areas working on that. So again, you're never alone. Like, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're worth $100 billion and your kid has autism, ASD. There's no cure, there's no treatment, there's nothing. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Yet, with just a little bit of effort right now, we can build it as an open infrastructure for the 5% of people in the world that know someone with autism, the 50% of people in the world that receive a cancer diagnosis of them or someone they love, and they feel that loss of agency. So we're going to return agency to humanity that way. And again, it needs to be an open infrastructure that they can then access private data sets and compensate them appropriately. So everyone is incentivized. We need that fast. Yeah. And, and that's a beautiful vision. It is again, infrastructure. It, and one of the things that's so beautiful about it is, guess what? All 8 billion people, we're all human. We're all running the same software. And the, the, the breakthroughs and the knowledge accumulated in, you know, in Kazakhstan is going to be as useful in Kansas. Yeah. 
I mean, but this is the thing, operating system. This is the biggest upgrade to the human operating system we can imagine because we're going from analog to digital. Text is black and white, whereas this, these models only understand context. You know, Daniel Kahneman just passed, you know, amazing kind of guy. But, you know, he did have this concept of type one, type two thinking. And so we had one, which is these big data things that can only extrapolate. But now we have these models that understand context. And so we have the missing parts of the brain and that will allow us to extrapolate, allow us to have more rainbows, you know, have the context of each individual, and push intelligence to the edge. And that's why, again, there is this imperative to do this now because there's a window on the freedom, agency, democracy side. But the other imperative is no one should have to suffer as they're suffering now. Yeah, amazing. And how much does it actually need? Does it need that much, which is the really amazing stuff? This, the total amount spent in generative AI, I think I said at the conference, is less than the total amount spent on the Los Angeles San Francisco railway, which hasn't even started yet. And and in building stable health again, if, if that's what it's called, I mean the amount of capital required to build that is de minimis compared to what's spent on a single human trial of any any drug. Yeah, it is. But then you know you build it and you get to that eighty twenty incredibly quickly that will change hundreds of millions of lives and that will attract the smartest people in each of these areas thinking about what is the open infrastructure of multiple sclerosis of longevity of cancer and more. But then you can amp that because the value is so, so huge. And you, I hope to build a trusted organization as part of this whole human operating system upgrade. You know, that's what I want to build. I want to build human OS, or at least catalyze it. Again, I don't want to run or control or own anything. I want to figure out how to give back that control. Because who should decide what cancer knowledge goes in there? Who should decide what education, et cetera? 